just by telling you guys what kind of day I've had. I left here where I am in Charlottesville and drove to Richmond. I was like, hey, I'm going to go test drive a Tesla today. I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to go see what the fuck this car is all about. Finally got to do it. I On my way there, I have a blowout in my oh, car. Shit. And I, I don't have, I'm like, well, holy shit, what am I going to do? So I was actually like 15 minutes away from the dealership. I was like, now I'll deal with this after. So I go, I drive the car, I have a great time. <laughs> when I get back to my car, it's like leaning to the side. That's how blown out, the, like that's how bad it was. And when I started driving, where you can hear, okay, maybe I should go take care of this now. I should, so I did, but I can't take it away today. It still takes like days. I did buy it. So I'll probably get it on Tuesday. Um, like, I if anybody is in my car stuff, <laughs> I did say, I was like, Hey, wh- what will it take for me to be like, be able to leave here today? And I'm like, well, you can't actually do that. But, um, so I bought it. I was very excited. If either of you guys are curious or if anybody listening is curious, um, go to my Instagram and you'll get to see me driving, driving way too fast. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's nice. It's a nice ride. Um, I think it's a little bit expensive for, what i now a little bit so it's 30 <laughs> welcome to breaking geek radio the podcast the the tesla show um <laughs> tesla edition yeah tesla edition um not paid for so tesla, though. i what i now understand about it like i kind of had an understanding about this but sitting there in the dealership i understand it even more there's a standard version of this car that you can get for thirty five thousand dollars boom okay you can add on things to the car like autopilot or sport mode or like get a, like a performance version of the car. All of these things are just software <laughs> that cost $2,000 or $10,000 for them to beam to your vehicle and make it go faster or make it do autopilot. So, so yeah, technically, if you access. see somebody with a sport version of this, Exactly. I was wondering, I was like, <laughs> when do we get to the, to like homebrew Teslas? Like it's going to happen. Like it has to happen. Um, but I, I had a blast driving it. I drove the performance version of it and it is, uh, is a lot of fun and it's different than my car. So I'm coming from a, a three series BMW and the, it, in terms of like size and type, it's the same, but the center of gravity is very different. So for me, I just realize you guys can't see me. For me, um, the um, the center of gravity in this car is right underneath you. It's centered versus um, the three series where the engine is in the front. The batteries for this are right underneath you. Yeah. So it feels different when you're like turning hard and doing all this stuff. Um, but it feels great to drive. But it's frightening because there's no torque and it doesn't rev the same way a combustion engine does. So I'm going from 60 to 90 miles an hour without the car really telling, (laughs) right? Like when you're driving 90 miles an hour in a lot of cars, you can hear, you hear it revving, you hear all of that stuff. None of that stuff exists in this car. And so there's just pure speed and that's scary, but it's also very fun. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah. like I said, if you guys are curious about it, check out my Instagram. It's the same as my Twitter handle. It's at Sir Jones Houston. Um, talking to you, uh, Jammer, and you, Nick, but also anybody in the audience that's just curious. Because I, I did a little recording. Uh, I did a little thing. But uh, it'll take some time whether I know that I can recommend it to someone else. But at least for me right now, it seems like a fun drive. Fun drive. So, I mean, it's at, it's at least worth trying out, right? Just yeah. you know, going on a test drive, no commitment or anything. I don't know yeah. what kind and of a person it's a it's a, it's makes sense for because I, I don't know the logistics of like what it takes to charge your car, if it's actually eco friendly, depending on where you're getting electricity from, all that stuff. So just yeah. it all depends. And the nice thing is that the supercharger network is relatively built out. You could charge it at home if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. There's a supercharger like two minutes from my house. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I, one of the other things I thought was pretty interesting, I was deciding between a new, newer version of my car, which is a three series or this, 
Tesla is giving me more money for my car than BMW. Where? Your last one? Yeah. It's weird, like thousands more. How much destroy it and more. save the environment? Thousands, oh, wow. three thousand dollars more. Like a significant amount. A a decision changing amount. <laughs> well, well, how much? How much? Here's the question: How much money do you have to put out compared to the other? At the end of the day, how much more yeah. expensive is the Tesla versus your other next one that you would get? Um, none. They they are equivalent. Fuck. Yeah, nice. that's cool. So I mean, I I'm guess the downside away. is that you can't exactly you can't exactly drive across the country in Teslas these days. Um, Why not? Comfortably. Why not? Why not? Fucking find a charging, charging station. station. How- are there enough charging so, stations? Because my so friend there are, has an electric car, a full electric car, and she can't go very far. Because Colorado, at least, you're going to run out of charging stations if you try to drive to the mountains or something. So there are two things with the superchargers. One, yes, there are a significant amount of them. But two, if you wanted to drive across the country, there's this feature in the car where you could use the map. So imagine a giant iPad, like a, a giant iPad Pro. That's the center console. And that's all there is that you use to control everything. And you can tell it navigate from point A to point B, but you can also say like navigate via charging stations. And so it will show you a route that is through supercharger land, basically. Yeah. Um, which is pretty slick. Pretty and smart. you pretty smart. get with the high performance version, you get 315 miles on a full charge. And it takes 15 minutes as a supercharger to get 80% of your battery back. Nice. It's actually a lot yeah. better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I thought, I thought it, it would take hours. <clears throat> I was thinking at least half an hour. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with it so far. I feel no regrets yet. Um, if that changes, just fucking take, sure just do it. No, just do it. Just fucking it's done. pull the trigger. It's done. Oh, you did. You bought it. You oh, I did. That. Yeah, I did it. Just to wait Dude, I, oh, I didn't hear that. I, I, heard, yeah. I thought you were still making a decision. Car. Yeah, I okay. did it. Okay, well, um, well good for uh, you. It'll be here on Tuesday. It is shipping from Atlanta, and then I've got to detail it, and then I'll just go in and pick it up. Nice. Congrats, you guys man. ever watch Silicon Valley? Yeah. I, I keep being told that I should watch Silicon Valley. Is that the same thing? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, <laughs> but there's this gr- funny subplot where uh, Kumail Nanjiani's character – he's really vain and he wants to be the only person in the office to like have a specific Tesla. Mm-hmm. And he just like tries to convince all these people to get Tesla so he can get this special exclusive Tesla that is from like referrers only. And it's just <laughs> the extra lengths he goes to, to make it happen is ridiculous. It's so funny. I don't even remember that episode. Maybe it was the last season. Uh, I don't think it was, it was the last, the last season. season. I think it was like, I think it was the second to last season. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. You guys ready to do a show? Or you want to talk about cars some more? Let's do a show. I don't know shit about cars. Let's do a show. <laughs> I know what a Tesla what's, is. BMW what's the name of the show with the old guys that talk about cars? What is that? What car talk. That? And they don't do it anymore because one of them's dead. We could be car. We could fill that. No, 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 no. Oh. Not, not, not car. T- the one on TV. The one with stick. Top Gear? Um, there you go. Thank you. Top Gear. Yeah. Oh, we, we couldn't be Top Gear. We could be Car Talk. Why can't we be Top Gear? Why can't we be Top Gear? I don't want to I don't want to be either of those things. Why? They have so much fun. I don't want to do car talk. Well, what <laughs> car talk? I don't. I don't know shit about cars. My my, my car two knowledge. Brothers making fun of each other. <laughs> yeah, you could be. You could be that guy, right? You like. You could be like, well, what the fuck is this? Why is this? And why is that? I would be that and guy be too, like, though. Yeah. And then Jonesy would have to explain everything. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds like every movie that I like, and you all hate. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a Christopher Nolan movie. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I guess we could talk about movies. We could talk about movies and movies and, and stuff like that. You guys ready? You guys ready yeah. to get into it? All right. Yeah. If I if I disappear for 10 to 15 minutes at a time, just ignore it. It's all good. I have been under the weather for fucking three days. It's so wait, off. have you figured out what it is yet? No. I took two COVID tests, home tests. Both of them came back negative. I'm taking another test in a couple of hours. Like that's one that's um, an actual place to go to, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, it's been 
<laughs> nightmare. Why not? Why don't nightmare. you trust? Why don't you trust the home test? Because I feel like shit, and I want to make sure that if I'm doing anything, that I'm not going to get other people COVID. I'll just give them the flu instead. Well, yeah, you should still not hang out with people if you're sick. I should, I should, I should give rule. them the stomach flu instead. It's <laughs> the old rule. If you're feeling sick, don't hang out with people. Yeah, just put some tussing on it. It'll be all right. It's no fun. Just I'll just wear a mask. You test two with all those? I should, but no. All right, fine. Well, jumping into actual movie stuff that's not about Jammer being sick. Uh, you know who's not feeling ill is Nia DaCosta. So Candyman, which on the last show I gave short shrift to, um, debuted at number one in the box office, which we didn't know at the time. I enjoyed it. It's a good movie, uh, but it is the first movie to break the box office number one that was directed by an African-American woman, which is crazy. Um, crazy. Ever? In 2021, we're still ever. Yeah. Ever, ever. That's yeah, I up. saw that too. So with $22.3 million, she has become the first uh, African American woman to have her film debut at number one in U.S. theaters. So, um, congrats to her. Uh, it's a fun movie. It's a good movie. I'm curious. Um, so, some of the articles I read talked about it as a reboot. I don't. I can't tell if it's a reboot or a sequel. I don't know. Soft or a remake? It's not a remake. 100 percent not okay. a remake. Um, okay. That so one like I could eliminate. Suicide Squad compared to Suicide Squad. Only if the original Suicide Squad was actually. I think good. the. I think the Suicide Squad for me, it's a sequel. It is. It is a sequel. Yeah. There's enough it is differences where you're like, no, it's a sequel. No, they're it's not. A sequel. They're not enough. They're not enough. To, what are the differences? Where you where you don't they didn't bring think back half the is... living characters from the last one? So that what? doesn't mean maybe anything. they got out of jail. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they were pardoned. Maybe they died. Wish I were too. Only mission. brought back Jackie Chan and freaking and, and Chris Tucker. Is that not a sequel now because the other characters aren't around? <laughs> <laughs> they brought back the captain in the second one also. <laughs> brought him back to kill him yeah i feel like the loose definition of that specific film um is weird like the way people have that conversation like it yeah. it seems very strange to me it it's like being in a room where everybody is high and drunk and saying something weird you're like i have no idea what the fuck you guys are talking about this is very obviously a sequel these are okay yeah. these are bad examples because the first film is good but it's like alien jurassic park and the first mission impossible where they change genres basically feels like a whole different tone and genre no no <laughs> I agree. Disagree. that's so almost you're saying, like saying so that you're saying wait, so you're saying a reboot aliens is not a sequel aliens is not it is no it's I, I'm, I'm just changing it i'm saying there are sequels but they've switched genres alien so is a horror movie aliens is an action movie Dress, uh, Mission Impossible but they're sequels. is a thriller but, but movie. Is, Mission Impossible is alien, an action movie. Yes, I already walked reboots. back on that part. God damn it. Okay. I'm saying it's a, it's a, it's, but, it feels less like a sequel, even though it is because it... it I, I really just think that your inability to make the argument isn't your fault. It's really just because the thing that they're saying about Suicide Squad and does the, the Suicide Squad doesn't make sense. It's not a you I mean, thing. It's definitely it's, a, literally what they're just doing they're just trying to distance themselves from it understandably yeah. so it's like oh it's not the it same i mean it's not a sequel it's like yeah it is but i get what you're doing you're, you're saying it because different tone different style but same characters same basic concept same actors same everything else but you know yeah i i feel bad that we have taken a story about nia DaCosta and rolled it back into suicide squad so <laughs> i'm gonna bring it back and just say like yeah it's a great achievement it sucks that it one took this long two that it happens in the midst of a pandemic right because i know there are people out there who will put an asterisk on it and say like mm. well the only reason this could have happened is because barely anybody is going to the movie theater well, um, still the one that drew the most people to the movie theater regardless if it was yeah still i mean look against at, other movies that didn't draw as many people true yeah, like, sh- yeah. i was gonna say shang chi but that's this week the it's one thing right. i saw on twitter yeah uh is a lot of people like all the trades are like Jordan Peele's Candyman, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people are online. It's like, say her fucking name. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, he produced it. But, and maybe it's even called that. I don't know. It's like Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas is not it's directed not. by Tim Burton, nor is yeah. it written by Tim Burton, nor is it. <laughs> it's so produced, yeah. I can see that in two different ways. Like, yes, I get the people that are upset over it because it feels like you're taking something away from her. However, the thing that will get you the clicks is Jordan Peele's name. So also, in an industry 
that is driven by how many clicks you get on your website, you that's, that's the name true. that you put. I also think that's how Harvey you Weinstein's money. Pulp Fiction. No, it's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> but no, that's true. I'm sure that's how you sell extra tickets too. Like, I mean, yeah, people like Candyman, marketing. if you're like, well, Jordan Peele's involved with the reboot, sequel, reimagining. And you're like, oh, he's got a good track record even when he produces shit. Right. Yeah. So, but good for her. Um, that's great news. That's, that's great. fantastic news. It's a bummer that you're right. It will have an asterisk on it. But as Nick said, that can't take away from the impact it's having in the midst of the pandemic. So good for it. Good, good for the movie. For good for her. It. Good for it. Um, Jammer, there was a news story that popped up about One Piece. Do you want to do that? I only saw yeah. the picture because I was driving my. I mean, that's vehicle. that's all there is. That's all there is. Picture of the script with the logo. So the picture, or there are two things to pull from it. So you had a picture of the script. Mm-hmm. The first episode is called Romance Dawn. Uh, it's written by Matt Owens and Steve Maeda. If I'm not mistaken, Matt Owens is the head writer and Steve Maeda is the showrunner based on One Piece, obviously by Ichiro Oda. And so let's, let's talk about Romance Dawn. I'm not sure you don't know. Uh, the manga starts off with Luffy as a child and kind of shows his origins of why he wants to become a pirate. It's about 65 pages long. And um, it's, it's just a nice start. You know, just just the way the whole thing shakes out. The anime does things a little differently. They start in the present day and they don't get to the past until like four episodes in. Mm. So this is just a confirmation. They're starting from the beginning, which is logical. I always thought it was weird. They started at a different point in the in the anime. So a lot of shows seem to do that these days, even like WandaVision. It's like now we're going to go show you how shit happened like seven episodes in. Right. Yeah, I can Including see your point. jumping in time, not just like flashbacks. Um, and then the logo itself, it has a skull and crossbones. The crossbones wearing a, a straw hat. And if you zoom in way, way, way into the nose, you see a <laughs> zoom silhouette in there. Wait, but do you have to enhance? Or can you just enhance. Enhance. Obviously, you have enhance. to enhance. Okay, okay I'm sorry. Uh, you, see, you see a silhouette of Luffy um, in there. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I think it looks a little ha- like a little hokey, to be honest. The logo itself, it looks a little. Wait, did, did you do the zoom in enhance, or did other people do this? Other people did it. Okay. Did you use that? Yeah, I'm not the cool military scope they like revealed this week, where it's like you can see clearly for fucking. I don't know how far. Have you seen that video? Or like they're watching girls on the beach, and then it zooms out, and they're like miles and miles and miles and miles away. And it's a clear image. No, but way to keep it super creepy and be, bring it back to anime. Like, well, huh. that's why I thought it was weird. I'm like, I hope this isn't the military showing it. I hope this is two guys who bought it because it starts with girls playing on the beach and then it zooms out to reveal they're on a rooftop, like oh, an impossible distance away for that clear of an image based on the tech we've seen before. Like Bathsheba, sure. don't do it. Sure. Um. All right. Do you want to stick with the the? Wait. Do you you don't care about this, right? So, Nick. You haven't watched One Piece, you haven't read One Piece, but if they made it into a Netflix series, like a live action, like they're doing with Bebop, would you watch it? I'll try it. Depends how good Bebop is, really. And Bebop looks great, well, just based on the cast. So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel like there's any different reason, any reason not to try it, especially since it's not going to be, it's not going to feel as, you know, there's so many episodes, there's so many you know, issues of it and stuff. If they're starting it with a, you know, I assume it's an English production. Um, if there's, yeah, so if they're starting it from the beginning from someone who's never read it or had to, or watched it before, it's much easier to jump onto the first episode of a live action show. So especially if it's getting buzz, I have no idea why I wouldn't watch it. Yeah, I'm really curious how American audiences are going to uh, adapt to it because while One Piece has been around for a while, it, it does not seem to have the same penetration in the American zeitgeist as Cowboy Bebop does. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm curious from that perspective whether or not people will latch onto it. But, and I wonder how the pacing is going to be considering there's so many anime yeah. episodes. Like how much they'll try to get through in season one. Because obviously yeah. they're not going to go as slow as a pace because they'll never get through that story if it's live action. No, never. Um, and with Bebop, it's slightly easier, right? Like it's a it's a known a thing. It has, yeah, it has a beginning and end. Um, I forget how many episodes there are. Is it 20, 12? There are not a lot. Two Netflix um, seasons, if I assume Bebop's Netflix and yeah. knock it out. Yep. So 
Um, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not sure I'll watch it. I, I, I really need to get back to the comic book, the manga, and what I haven't done is that, mostly because uh, the Camorn Strike book, I finished it, but then I was like, you know what? Let me see what this HBO series is all about. So I started watching the HBO show and uh, I've been burning through that. And so I'll probably finish that before I get back to uh, the manga. Really what that means is there's just, there's always something else. So much content. Mm. So much content. That's not, that's not one piece's fault. That's my fault. But ready to move on? Yeah. Let's move on. Let's bring it back to reboots. So we were having a conversation about what is and what isn't a reboot, whether or not it's a soft sequel reboot, blah, blah, blah. The Rocketeer, to which you say the Rocket who? The Rocketeer. Oh, is that like coming back? Movie. I've always seen the that movie is what this is. What? It's a great movie. I love, I love it. it. I've always just seen it once. Like I didn't see, I didn't watch it until uh, close to Captain America and the winners. I mean, the first Avenger came the first out one. because I knew it was Joe Johnson and he's doing like World War II type. And so I'm like, I see this. would, I would say that the Rocketeer is probably the exact reason why I like the first Avenger why, and why a lot of people don't. Like I saw so much of the Rocketeer's DNA. Mm-hmm. in the first avenger i was like yeah this is exact i did not expect this to be anything other than what i'm looking at like i and, love like the first one has like the best fucking villain ever yeah. actor playing him i don't want to give it away people haven't seen it but it's so great yeah i, I read I a know. description for this one wait to see, you didn't to want see to he, yeah, wait which are you play. trying not to spoil you trying not to spoil the original movie? the rocketeer <laughs> the, or the original rocketeer are you serious yeah. Fine, I'll spoil it. Timothy Dalton plays like Errol Flynn, basically. So good. <laughs> Working with the Nazis. <laughs> and like, so isn't good. there like a big blimp at the end or some shit? He's a giant Zeppelin. It's awesome. <laughs> the Zeppelins back then. Yeah, it was so good. I, I really like that movie. I'm, I feel like I need to watch the movie because it's on Disney Plus, right? It's on Disney Plus. I'll probably watch it this weekend. <laughs> okay. Um, so you started talking about it uh, the description of what the show is going to be. So oh, it's a show, this is not a report. Movie? Or do we know? I don't know Disney if we Plus know for movies sure. And shows. They do do both. Um... Either way, I'd rather it be a show, honestly. Yeah, I don't know. So this is the way the deadline is reporting it. It's that Disney will revive the 1991 classic. Mm. And they're going to be helped with, by it with... Um, David Oyewolo. So he is, I mean, he's played uh, Martin Luther King in Selma. He was in, uh, what's the British version of the FBI? Uh, MI5. MI6? No, MI5. MI6 is uh, the Bond. CIA, basic CIA yeah. ish. Um, so this is him uh, stepping into this role as a retired Tuskegee Airman who takes cool on the part. mantle. That is a cool, like, that Otherwise, is the thing that makes me yeah. want to do this. Because in my head, when I learned about the Tuskegee Airmen, I was like, oh, yeah, this is totally something that they would have tested on the Tuskegee Airmen or yeah. been a Tuskegee experiment prior to um, Billy. Was it Billy Crudup? Is that who was the first Rocketeer? I don't Maybe. think so. No. No, no, was that was Billy? no way. There's no who one I recognized I when remember. I watched it originally. Really? I'm going to look this up. I recognize um, Timothy Dalton, motherfucker. And, and the, the girl in it, I forgot her name. The woman Jennifer Connolly. Jennifer Connolly. Yeah, Jennifer Connolly. Yeah. Bill I Campbell. Don't. And it was a different Bill. Bill Campbell, not 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 Crudup. Campbell. I would watch a remake that with Crudup also. It could be a different the White Rock. <laughs> no, not now that I know project. that this exists. So there is um, a TV series for it that's a kids show on Disney Junior that premiered a couple of years ago. Really? Any good? I haven't seen it. I just looked it up on Wikipedia. God damn you. Um. So yeah, I, we don't know a lot about this version of it. It's going to be uh, written by Ed Rickert, who has worked on Now You See Me. He's also worked on uh, Netflix's Ew. Jessica Jones and Raising Dion. I did not see Now You See Me, which is now, what was Now You See Me about? It's about magicians. It's awful. It's oh, bad. that movie it's with um, Ruffalo? Yeah. Ruffalo's in the first uh, one. He's like chasing them. Sort of. Yeah. It's stupid. And the second one's even hey, worse. Hey, hey, hey. Spoiler alert. Hey, I already spoiled no. the one with the Rocketeer, which is much, much, much older. But that if you anyone who wanted to see now you see me either has or now you don't. 
Oh. Now you've seen it. Now you've seen it. Yeah, I feel like so. There's a sequel to this, right? There's a now yeah, you've seen it's, it. Yeah, it's even worse. Yeah, it's called now. They're, now they're I never want to see it. I did not like. That. There just, was supposed to be a third. There was one. this twist. There was this twist at the very end that, if you look back, makes zero sense. Like zero sense. Zero sense. Well, so many scenes come across as yeah. disingenuous as fuck. Completely illogical motivations. Just I never yeah. watched it more than once. Don't they switch out Isla Fisher? Oh, you for, watched it? Uh... No, I've seen the yeah, I've seen the first one. It took me a while. Like, like what is that? Oh, right. Yeah. Then they switch out Isla Fisher for Lizzie Kaplan. Is that who it was? Isla. Yes. Isla Fisher. Isla Fisher. And then uh, there was supposed to be a third one. There still might be. But because mm-hmm. now you see me movies don't do well in the English. I mean, <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> They also don't do well in the, in the English, but uh, it, it's a full Japanese production with the original actors who were supposed to be made in Japan for Japanese audiences. I'm not listening to anything you're saying right now. It doesn't do as good as in the English. In well, the English. Uh, literally, it does better in the Chinese, where uh, China was supposed to make a third one, just like China was going to fund World of Warcraft 2, because they were literally making the sequels for Chinese audiences, because American audiences really didn't give a shit about either of those films. You know why? They weren't good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I looking <laughs> at this writer's pedigree, kind of worried, um, especially because I have not liked um, Oyelowo's last couple of movies that I've seen with him. They've been okay. And hearing, you know, Now You See Me and Jessica Jones and Raising Dion as this guy's as the writer's um previous work yeah yeah i've I've stopped you know obviously we still always speculate but i stopped worrying about so much with the writer because a great writer's next movie could be shit and the writer doesn't have a lot of experiences next movie could be their masterpiece you know what you speak speak the true true um he does especially (laughs) because of how collaborative because of how collaborative things are and like the different types of movies you're making like you could have a fantastic auteur director come in and make a studio film that's complete garbage because they were pushed out within the yeah. system. Or you can have somebody, you know, who takes every single note to please everybody, but when he has his own vision or her own vision, it's like great. Yeah. So it's Do you just think there was any talk of ever making the Rocketeer a Marvel movie since they own those properties and he's a I doubt it. superhero. I Captain doubt America it. kind of fills you, that What role. you mean, like bringing the Rocketeer into the MCU? Yeah, like making the Rocketeer be an MCU movie or TV no show, thanks. not a no, no, no thanks. thanks. But I was wondering, no. like, it doesn't fall under Lucas. It would just be Disney then. It doesn't fall under Lucasfilm. Was it owned by Fox before? No, Disney made the original. No, I think no, it was Disney. Touchstone. Touchstone. Is it Disney or Touchstone? It's probably. Touchstone. I mean, they could. Let's be real. They could push it to whatever branch they want. I think it would be good as a Lucasfilm movie. That's what I was saying. If they, like, almost feels yeah. like a Lucasfilm project, not a. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I think Lucasfilm needs to start branding an identity outside of Star Wars. Um, and Indiana Jones, just because they And Indiana old. Jones. And I think The Rocketeer could be a way, good way to do that. But, you know, they're like, not going to. Yeah, it just I agree. like a Lucasfilm. I agree. Weird. <laughs> I love the, this is what they should, but they're not going to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it really doesn't matter in the end. Um, so jumping back and forth we were talking about anime before we were talking about one piece let's talk about netflix's one other piece. forthcoming anime uh cowboy bebop we got some stills recently within the last week and they showed uh spike they showed jet they showed Fay, and they showed ein which is kind of interesting uh given why because ein did not join the crew i think until um Ed until Ed joined. really I don't yeah. remember it's been a long yeah. time since I seen it. well they got to have think... the dog in there people are gonna that's like the, that's like the draw right now for people who sure. don't know the anime I just think that it's interesting um an interesting way to what it appears to be change the story so um I'm curious um one what did you guys think of the stills and then two are you more or less excited to see it Jammer I'll start with you because I know that you have a uh a, uh, you have a lukewarm feeling about Cowboy Bebop? Yeah, I don't know how I feel about these images. <laughs> They're like, they feel like out of Dick Tracy or something with the colors. Okay. 
Um, not as weird as Dick Tracy. It wasn't the one where like everyone was wearing like so much prosthetics to make him look like the character. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't look like, um, it like that. <laughs> right. So I mean, it looks kind of like Dick Tracy. You know, the bright costumes and the sort of bombastic set design. Like even the inside of the Bebop itself, it has like that yellow couch. Just feels a bit weird. Feels a bit artificial. Um, but I don't know. I'm not going to judge it beforehand. But overall, I think. I'll watch Especially it. Being a Speed Racer fan. Well, Speed Racer went all in. Yeah, but if you follow the first images, you just be like, oh, this is too colorful. Yeah. And then when you watch true. it, you're like, it works. So maybe this will well, be like that for you. The thing is, it works for me. I don't yeah, know. It works I know for you. That's people. what I'm saying. So maybe yeah. you'll get, maybe this will work for you too. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But I mean, it looks, I'll watch it. We'll see how it goes. Um, I like the cast, but John Cho. Yeah. I mean, he's a bit old for the role, but whatever. We'll, we'll deal. We'll deal. Wow. Um, wow. Look at you all ageist. Oh. He's like 45. The character's like in his 20s. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so I just think it's... I think it, Look at I his abs. Know. Look at his abs. It, he looks pretty good for his age. He, he's he he's pulling the Paul good. Rudd there. Yeah. Looks pretty good. Yeah. It's like that scene in, in Ant-Man where Paul Rudd has his shirt up and you're like, ooh, got the obligatory, you know, semi-shirtless shot in. Just so that we know that he's buff underneath underneath those clothes. Who knows? He so, a little bit. It's kind of funny. I don't know if you knew this when you said that about his age. I can't find it right now, but there was an article where John Cho did talk about his age. And oh yeah. To the character. Yeah, he said something like he he's, he's forty nine. Yeah, he's aware of the age difference, and so okay. he. Um, I gotta find it. I'll find it. We'll Actually, I found it. Something else. I found it. Okay. Looks young enough. This not to play like old man. It's like I don't like to do like a Logan or a like. Oh, I'm too anyway, old for this shit version. Anyways, the biggest fear I had was I was too old. I knew people were gonna have issues with my age, and I had to get over it. <laughs> I'm not a person. I'm not a person who says age is just a number or whatever. It was gonna be harder physically, and I was gonna look different than a 25 year old guy. At some point, the opportunity is yes or no. Do you want to do it? And I did want to do it. So I wasn't going to stop myself from doing it. And you know what? Good for you. You hear that, like, Jammer? Not... Fuck you. You hear that? Heard... He, was like, he was like, I saw you coming. I saw you. I was like, I saw you coming around the corner. Your freaking screen just went off. Dipshit. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> you he don't have to me. see me to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I see you. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's fair. Good for him. Good on him for for going ahead of the haters and saying like, you know what? I know I'm old, but I wanted to do it. So deal with it. Fuck all the jammers. Yeah, for all the jammers out there, fuck you. you go fuck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had a couple other news stories, but not really all that interesting. Um, actually, Nick, did you want to talk to Patty Jenkins' comment? Yeah, I'll need to pull up exactly what she said because I don't want to miss So it. Patty Jenkins said, all the films that our streaming services are putting out, I'm sorry, they look like fake movies to me. I don't hear about them. Uh, I don't read about them. It's not working as a model for establishing legendary greatness. And she doesn't mean legendary pictures. I think she just means like, yeah, yeah. you know, the yeah, word. Because legendary the word pictures generally. movies have been released online this year. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and Nick, you brought up the story. You want to talk about this. Well, I brought it up just now, but you brought it to our attention later. What do you, how do you feel about this? It's obviously, I think it's a stupid comment to say. Um, or is worse. it? I don't know. Cause here's her comment is very similar to Scorsese's comment where she, where he's like, I don't watch them, but they're theme park rides. And she's like, I don't watch them. I don't pay attention to them, but they don't look like movies. Did she say she didn't watch them? She's like, I don't give them any mind. I don't read about them. I don't bother with them. And even I, more, I think, yeah. is she just talking about the format of watching movies at home? Because most of the movies we've gotten in the last year and a half have been made for theaters and ended up on streaming. Yeah. Like, what was the last, even one of the last Netflix films I watched. No, no, I watched um, Vacation Friends um, the other week. Was that good? It's great. And they already greenlit a sequel. But um, okay, it had like a, they calling it a Hulu original, but it very much looked like it, like it had a studio like a logo Nola in front Holmes. of it. That's actually really th- one thing I want to say. I thought was a interesting about Vacation yeah. Friends 
was Vacation Friends at the top left had a 20th Century Studios logo at the top left yeah. of the logo. And it I'm wondering, movie. will the 20th Century Studios logo be on all movies going forward for those movies, or is it just for ones that go straight to streaming? Mm. What do you mean? Because Free Guy had 20th Century logo on it because they're Disney no on the on the logo on the logo. Like if you see Free Guy around the Free Guy logo, do you see 20th Century Studios logo? Oh no, just in the movie. I'm wondering if it's just a way for them to like branded because you see it on the actual poster when you click on hulu i think I it was um, because it was originally meant for theaters maybe it's been pushed back long enough and hulu bought it maybe hulu co-funded it they keep calling it a hulu original movie but well because they bought they bought the rights to stream it that's why and hulu well, was the one so that's the thing it. you said it's a 20th century movie i don't know if they had to buy the rights to stream it Disney owns it. That's true. Right. That's what I'm saying. I think it was meant to be theatrical is my main point. Oh yeah, yeah. It definitely was for sure. And it looks great. I don't, hell I watched, I've only seen Wonder Woman 84 at home. I've that only seen it looks once like a movie. too. Yeah. I only I watched seen it, it once. I I I'm not going to watch it once. again. Here's yeah. the thing. I What's don't it? agree with her comments, but I think there is kind of some semblance of validity. If you look at it from a different perspective and what I think it is, what I think it is, is that what I think I've learned for this past year and a half is that I just don't think about, they're not as special when I don't have to go to the theaters. So they're not as memorable. Whenever I have to go to the theaters, I have to focus completely on the movie. So they t- generally mean more to me. When I watch it at home, I tend to be distracted. I might be on my phone. So even if the movie's good, I might well, not, it might not, hold on. It might not be as special to me in the long run and therefore won't be as impactful. And I think that probably pr- is true for a lot of people. And then also when you're releasing something on streaming every week, it's different from yeah. releasing it on theaters and making it an event. So like in that I mean, sense, I could see where she's coming from. And well, you've talked about that before, right? Like you talked about yeah. Suicide Squad and like you saw it, you gave it one grade and you watched it again. And having seen it again and being able to connect to it, and I think you might've said the first time you watched it, you had your phone with you. No, no, you were, you, no, no. no? You were zeroed in. Okay. Zeroed in. Um, Yeah, yeah, no. That was just a difference where I had a specific experience and I was like, I think I couldn't get attached to the characters because I didn't want to get attached to a character and have them die. I remember you said that. Um, So then, and then I watched it again and it got better and I watched it again and it got a little bit better. I think, I think I might be skewing to the A minus now. (laughs) Yeah. I did it. closer to my A plus. I'm taking, yeah, I think it's an A minus now. I still think that, um, that the Harley Quinn side quest is a little bit long and you That's can smart. use a little bit of cutting. Okay. It drags for me. Um, and, and especially whenever you cut to the bad guys, I'm like, ah, oh, boring scene. Um, but other than that, I Wait, think it's- which good. bad guys? Not the all a- bad anything guys? Anything with, with, with the thinkers or the president or the general. Aren't they all bad guys? Isn't that why they're in jail? Oh my God. All right. I'm not talking about the squad. <laughs> I fucking so hate you. At, three or four of them have the tattoo from the original movie. <laughs> the antagonists. <laughs> There you go. <gasps> All right. Well, we'll, we'll I go think with that. With Patty Jenkins' comments, is just, it's belittling like an entire, I don't know, just to write it all off. It's like, first of all, her peers are directing and are in these movies. Zack Snyder did Army of the Dead just for Netflix. He has like a Netflix, it sounds like Netflix is his new home after Warner Brothers, like yep, fucked over his is. movie. Um, and like, the same day she said that the trailer for Gal Gadot's Netflix movie came out. Yeah. So it's like, Wait, okay. Gal Gadot, The Rock, and Ryan Reynolds, right? So three of the yeah. biggest stars there are right now. And like, because yeah, early on, I would agree. There was like a Bob Odenkirk movie called Girlfriend's Day or something that I actually stopped mm-hmm. watching because it was like a Chapman student or someone shot it, like still a student. Whoa, Chapman is a fantastic institution. But when you go to those, dare when, you? when you go to those things at the end of the year to like watch your friend's movie and you watch all the other movies and you're like, oh God, half of these look like they didn't learn anything. They just got their hands on cameras. <laughs> but um, um, I don't know. There's a big difference. I just think that, and especially since like she says, no one who works on that stuff becomes legendary. And no, it's like, she said it's not like a, a formula. She said it's not a formula for legendary greatness. But it is like that's where young directors are getting their chances. That's where established directors but are getting legend- even but, more but, options, like Martin but, Scorsese's but, gonna. But she thinks the model. But is- legendary, but legendary greatness. Like, are are people actually paying attention to who's making these movies, or are they just 
throwing them into the into the queue, watching them and forgetting about them immediately. But I so mean, I'll, I'll jump in here yeah. and I will say that I I'll defend the statement from this perspective. I don't know what the context was. And so I don't know what the question was that elicited this response. Um, it might have been about the specific business model. And I know for a fact that Jammer, you and I have talked about this before. The cycle and speed at which some of these movies are coming out, even before we hit the pandemic, causes people to forget about them. There's no water cooler discussion about some of the things that drop on Netflix. There's no water cooler discussion about some of the movies that drop on Hulu. And you will see a thing when you're flipping through these uh, streaming services, you go, oh, I want to watch that. And you'll forget about it for weeks. Yep. And from that perspective, I 100% get what she's talking about. It is, to your point, Jammer, an event to go see a movie at a theater, and it creates a very different impression on your mind. And so I, I get what she's saying. I wish I knew what the full context of the statement was. But at least in that nugget of truth, at least in that nugget she said, I find some aspect of truth to it. Yep. That's how I feel she too. Just, I don't know. It still reminds me of Scorsese. She sounds elitist. I think it's hard to wield hundred million dollar budgets and not be somewhat of an egotistical asshole. Not you're even necessarily fun, an asshole. You're belittling other directors. Just like Scorsese was, when it's like no, James Gunn probably looked no. up to you, and then you're like, I think the difference Fuck is his this. movies. There's roller coaster. The difference, rides. the difference is Scorsese was belittling. He was being derisive, and I saw the full context of his statement. And he was being an elitist dick, and he's saying what is and isn't art. Here, I can see a different interpretation of what she's saying. She's talking about the business model. She says the model is not one for greatness. That's not necessarily talking about the movies and the quality. She's not saying that the films that they release on Netflix and Hulu are theme park rides. She's saying that the model of the streaming services is the thing that causes them to not be great. Isn't part of the quote, they literally, they don't look like real movies. Yeah. The all part I, of the quote is all the films that streaming services are putting out. I'm sorry. All, they look like fake movies to me. All too. Oh, it's, um, not, it's not some, it's not, it's an absolute. And then to, I, my favorite response on Twitter to that was like, all movies are fake. <laughs> so it's, it's weird. And maybe I wish I could see all of this together because they're two yeah, different statements. Would help. One of them is I don't hear about them. I don't read about them. It's not a working business model. So maybe she is talking about two different things. Maybe there is a question of quality. And then there's also a, um, a conversation in the context about what the business model is for these companies. So I don't know, because it's not true. I don't know yeah. that I think that Gal Gadot's movie looks like a fake movie. I don't know that um, six under, like any Ryan Reynolds movie. Or that Patty Jenkins's movie. movie. Yeah. yeah. Scorsese's so, movie. Enola Holmes. So I don't know that I think that, I'm hoping she doesn't mean what it looks like she means. I can see another potential interpretation. We'll but see what she says I've been next fooled on that, right? Yeah, we'll see what one. happens, right? Because yeah. I got fooled on that before. Villeneuve, I was like, hey, I don't think he means what it looks like he means. And then he sure as fuck doubled down on that shit. Yeah. And Let's made see me look she's like doubles down shit. or just makes it more clear, adds more context. That'll have yeah. to happen soon because a lot of people are talking about that comment, including filmmakers. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll reserve judgment because Denny Villeneuve made me. Fuck that guy. Anyway. <laughs> Um, you want to do, uh, you know what? Let's jump into what if let's just, let's just do it. You want to do what if, did you watch it? Have what you seen if? the new episode? What if, what if the doctor lost his heart instead of his hands? Uh, this is the fourth episode of Marvel's what if in the animated series that we're seeing so far. And it looks like Nick, it looks like your theory about this all coming together and meaning something. Your it's theory. <laughs> I'm an idiot. No, your, it's your, it's your theory, Nick. You're the only ones who said it. I doubted you to begin with. Um, Shut up. <laughs> but, it looks, but it looks like this might be coming to something. So in this episode of Marvel's What If, we got to see what happened if Dr. Stephen Strange lost his heart. And in that context, they mean Christine, right? Dr. Christine. Yeah. What is Christine's last name? I can't remember her last name. I don't think um, it matters. Well, she would be doctor. It matters. She would be doctor so, something. 
So it's funny that you say that it doesn't matter because there's an aspect to this episode that um, has been a topic of conversation in comic books for a very long time. The use of Christine just as a prop to get the doctor to go on this journey, mm -hmm. which is interesting because she very much was not his motivation to become Doctor Strange in the mainline MCU universe, yeah. which is unique in some ways, right? She had zero, zero, she was not the impetus for him to go seek out the mystic arts. He wanted to fix and his so, hands and learn from somebody He wants to fix his hands. And so here, the big difference is that um, we see her get killed again and again and again. And there's a, a conversation about um, fridging. Mm -hmm. That comes from the Green Lantern series where, you know, a murdered girlfriend in the refrigerator is that thing that we need to, to push the hero on his journey. And so that's a long way of saying, like, it sucks. I can't remember her name and it does matter. But it's very interesting that within the context of this very specific episode, you say that. Um, I'll just start out. What did you think of the episode as a whole? I liked it. Um, I've liked them all to a different extent. This one, I would put behind it would be my second favorite i would still put it behind star uh t'challa star lord star t'challa still has the most that one still yeah varies the most from the comic you know the most variations within the universe i mean the movies you know the mcu where it's like everything thanos isn't even a bad guy because of the right <laughs> events that took place where this was closer to captain carter or nick fury's big week you know which isn't called that i mean that's not what the episode's about where it's like it recut it like redoes like it, it it reshows you like the first half of the movie just quicker yeah. and then it starts getting into the real variations okay and so yeah i enjoyed it and i i was this one has the most impressive voice cast because i believe every ma major character is came back yeah like this one has everyone <laughs> yeah i um i would say the same for the performances I thought they were really good. I would put Benedict Cumberbatch as probably my favorite performance in this, mostly for this reason. He played two different variants of himself. So the version of Doctor Strange we got when the um, Ancient One split him into two different people into two different timelines, that original recipe, quote unquote, timeline, even seem different than the MCU version that we're accustomed to yeah. um, in some ways. And then the, the, the darker journey, Strange, um, was even different than him. And so in that respect, I really like that we got to see Benedict Cumberbatch kind of like stretch into this role a little bit and, and play it a different way. And it kind of makes me wonder what we're going to get going forward. Like, if that's what we got just in this 30-minute episode, what are we going to get in something like uh, Multiverse of Madness or in Spider-Man 3? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think that, that the possibilities that this show is showing me are endless. <laughs> are endless. And they, they excite me, right? I, I really like that. It also, on a brief side note, it also kind of annoys me a little bit that if Kevin Feige and Ryan Coogler are so certain that they're not going to recast T'Challa, that we've gotten so many different versions of all these different characters that they can't find a way to make that work. But that's just a side note. Well, um, I don't know if it was a rumor this week, but the actress who plays Sherry, they say she got a, a big fat like contract to be in multiple movies. And I already was assuming she'd be the next Black Panther. I mean, I don't care about her being the next Black Panther. You and not sort of from the Chala. sense, yeah, I, I don't, think there's any reason that she shouldn't be the next Black Panther. That's not the thing that bothers me about it. I just think that again, getting to see T'Challa as Star-Lord, pretty cool. So I think that there is a way to have this character exist in the world. T'Challa is more than Black Panther is basically what I'm saying. And so it would be nice to see him continue on. So for me, it bothers me that we're getting so many different variants of these other characters. And I'm going to say it this way, just to make it more impactful. All these white characters, we get to see how many different versions of Loki, how many different versions of Stephen Strange. How many Spider-Men are we getting? You can't find me another fucking T'Challa? Fuck out of here. Anyway. <laughs>
that's that's my TED talk. Thank you for coming. But um, Jammer, Nick and I uh, have said our piece about this week's episode of One What If. Did you get a chance to see it? And what did you think? I did not. I've been spending my week uh, in the fetal position, uh, pretty much rocking back and forth in my bed. Praying for death. Trying not to shit my brains out uh, and <laughs> mostly failing. So uh, you'd think I'd have time to actually watch things, but no, I spent most times just trying not to die, succeeding so far, I guess. So that's my okay. life right now. <laughs> um, so here are the things that we said while you were gone a second ago. Oh, I heard everything. One, oh, you heard everything. All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain this is probably going to be the wrap up to this since you didn't get a chance to see it. It seems like we are eventually going to get somewhere with this series. Like it is moving towards a very specific event and the thing that's happening where we've seen the watcher kind of um, um, closer and closer. He yeah, he's getting things. closer and closer to doing something. He's like, I, I got to do something here. It's crazy. Um, but I'm not going <laughs> to. But I'm not going to do it. Um, so it's interesting to see where this is going to go. And I'm curious what the event is going to be like. That's the thing that's making this much more interesting to me um, is what is going to be the final straw for him or because Kang. that would be a they great way to bring, Loki in bring it in if it's Kang or, or not even just Kang or what if it's, it's also uh, it can also be uh, the Ultron freaking vision no not, fuck that Ultron vision I don't know why no, I just no, got no, irrationally angry on about the that poster with you know Ultron vision actually having all six of the stones on his chest no That'd not that <laughs> No, I mean the freaking the deviants or whatever that the Eternals can't interfere with. Mm. It's like I'm gonna interfere, I'm gonna interfere, and then the things come, and then the Eternals come. And he's like, oh, never mind, I don't have to interfere. Why didn't so, you guys fight Thanos? I'm curious. The most recent Eternals. <laughs> I wish you would see this, Jammer, because I would ask you this question. We've gotten two episodes thus far with tentacled monsters, and I'm mm. curious whether or not that means something within the context of the show. Um, Hail Hydra. Kyle knows the name Hail of the Hydra creature. Shimagorath. Yeah, which is a multiverse traveling being that we've now seen twice. I would be super mm. shocked if it's not in Doctor Strange too. We've seen him 50% of the episodes that we've seen yeah. thus far, and I feel like that's got to mean something. Man, I saw the tentacles again. I'm like, I think he'll even go past the series. I think we'll see a Doctor Strange too. I wouldn't be surprised. Of, like, um, not necessarily ma- I don't know what the main villain even is in Doctor Strange. Wanda, the universe actually collapsing. It's Wanda. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think the main villain thing. could be the universe actually collapsing. I don't think Marvel's that existential that that's the villain. No, no, yeah. but I mean, but the idea of things getting ripped apart and trying to control them. That doesn't make it any less of a physical villain. Well, you don't need Marvel a physical villain, does. but yes, you do. Then Marvel, no, I just you said need a physical you do. Villain. I'm just oh, saying okay. that could be the like. That's not a physical villain. You need you need something you could punch. If you That's can't true. punch it, then it's not a villain. This isn't, this isn't Speaking Ro- of Emmerich's next movie. Yeah, exactly. Classing. This isn't 2012. No, he is another one. It's the movie, uh, no. Moonfall. The moon's, Moonfall. The moon's falling into the yeah. earth. That's the plot. I so I tweeted, cinema's night. finally back, baby. <laughs> that looks great. <laughs> new world ending. Majora's Mask. Great. I haven't seen it. I just thought about Majora's oh, okay. Mask, and I love that game. So yeah. um, It's the first thing I thought before watching the trailer. <laughs> Yeah. The other thing is what I was going to say about this episode is I think it's interesting about um, the watcher wanting to intervene. And this is I, I given how heartbreaking the wait, Jim, you haven't seen it. God damn it. I don't, hey, I don't care. It. Wait, okay. wait, what are you talking about? Wait, what are you talking about? Uh, what if the end of what if? Oh, I don't care about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I given how heartbreaking the ending was, um, like I said, I have to wonder what is going to be the thing that causes him to step in because watching the entire universe collapse because of his own actions is like it is a it is a thing that we haven't really seen in this universe like we've seen the snap and that's one thing this is one person as a focal point who is who's destroyed the universe and i think that that's fascinating and someone who has been basically rejected um based on like Christine saw what he became and didn't want to have anything to do with it, which I think is fascinating given the movie that we're going to be talking about later today. Um, so. Before we move on, I, I really like that Doctor Strange has studied the Watchers and is also aware of their presence when they're close. 
that's a really yeah. cool detail it's not like they're just completely unknown he's like i've studied you like i um, I, I felt your presence i'm hoping that means that in the mainline movies we are going like we're inching ever closer to that i yeah. hope they do not keep the watchers relegated to that like i know we've gotten them in a post credit scene let's go full-on weird and I also in the movie make- giant heads yeah <laughs> I also, they, we've seen them once, remember? They had giant heads. No, no, I said post credit. Oh. I preface that by saying, like, in the post credit scene, like, I want to see, like, in, in the movie. Like, you uh, want them to do stuff in movies, yeah. not just be existing mute and be mute. Not just have, yeah, not just have Stanley say a thing to him. And then I want to, yeah. I want to just bring up one interesting thing I noted this week that I probably should note earlier. So, what did you note? We have Wanda potentially destroying the multiverse we have kang letting it happen and we have it happening in spider-man 3 is it going to be like everyone doing it at the same time cracks it because it's like we keep thinking each one is the breaking of the multiverse and we have seen the things now too but then we also have dr strange in the trailer seemingly breaking it for the first time i don't think wanda Wanda didn't do anything. She did it, but she's going to be dabbling in that kind of stuff if she's looking for her kids. And she's a Nexus being. Sure. That's why some people for a while thought those two episodes lined up, which they don't. Loki. That's that's silly. But wouldn't it be crazy if the focal point is like want because time is kind of nebulous, especially at the end of the timeline, if not just the TVA, where it could be all those events kind of feel like the same time, at least the TVA. Doctor Strange making a spell like a fucking spell he shouldn't. L- Kang literally letting himself die so that the multiverse happens, and uh, Wanda fucking with it. It just feels like everyone at the same time is. We're not getting one break. It's like everyone at the same time is like, eh, let's fuck with it. And I and I saw the Spider Man trailer on the big screen last night, and yeah, Strange is like the multiverse is something we know very little about. It's like, bitch, I know more yeah. than you. Yeah, I feel like I got cheated because I didn't get it. Like I, I specifically said before I walked into Shang Chi, I was like, "Oh, I'm excited to see this on the big screen," and then I got nothing. I got both the Marvel ones, MCU. Oh, and the Eternals. And I got a uh, Bond and something else. I got oh, Bond. Dune. I got Eternals. I got Dune. I did not get Spider Man. I was afraid I wouldn't get Spider Man because it was safe for last. They probably you found out the it. person that leaked the trailer lives in Virginia. <laughs> They're like, "We're not showing you that shit, fucker." So funny. It is funny. Um, you guys ready to talk movie? What, what are you going to do, Jammer? Are you going to listen? What are you going to do? I'm probably going to step out because yeah, I, I don't want to get out. spoiled. I don't want the movie to be spoiled. Actually, I'll hear your first impressions, and then when you guys oh. move into spoilers, I will step out. Okay. Nick Dahl, shoot, first impression. I really, really enjoyed the action. Um, and honestly, if this was not the apocalypse i could see it being just as big as as important as black panther as far as representation and And by apocalypse you mean pandemic yeah yeah okay yeah that's not the apocalypse um for my first impressions i thought that the fight scenes were fantastic so Um, good and so fast but they're spoiled by really dodgy cgi like it like incredible like think this is just an explanation for Jammer so he understands the context. You remember in Infinity War when you would see Bruce Oh, Banner yes, Mark Ruffalo. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it was like that. I'm like, why is this happening? This looks horrible. I would compare it closer to Black like Panther. Which Black Panther, the fight scene. So there are a couple of... So I notice it less in the scenes with Black Panther just because that looked um, like they didn't have weight. This just looked... Like there were bad face replacements. The when they went to Tao Lao, the it just looked incredibly fake. Mm. So yeah. Well, yeah how's how's that, the actual movie? Good. Neither the of you really talked good. about the actual story or anything. You guys talk about the action. The action's yeah. really good. The the um, the story itself is really really good. I think that. Um, Tony Leung, is that how you say his last name? I am not sure, actually. I haven't looked he, that up. He's probably, if not the, one of the most sympathetic villains in the MCU, in most superhero movies, and I would say generally. They gave him a really, really good and sympathetic arc in this. 
It's kind of like Killmonger, only even more. Well, it's hard to get more sympathetic than Killmonger. He does worse. They both do terrible, terrible things, obviously. I would say the difference is Killmonger, he was definitely like, if Malcolm X was more murdery, that would be Killmonger in the sense like by any means necessary. And Killmonger heard that and was like, yeah, any means. I'm just going to kill people now. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. (laughs) But he doesn't trade lives. That's the difference. So here he did not seem like he wanted to kill people he wanted to keep his family together he wanted to find his wife like everything that he was doing wasn't about seeking revenge on the world and while i do think that in theory killmonger had um he was right about what is wrong with the world i think that the means that he used to do were just incredibly brutal and maybe they just didn't show us what I mean, I can see. I did. I, 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 as far as Killmonger goes, for me, I don't think he's sympathetic, but I think you could see where he's coming from, and I think there's a difference there. It's like, oh, yeah. he's not wrong. Like you could see that he, he's kind of right, um, but at the same time, still not really sympathize with him. So yeah. I think that's probably what it, what it is. For those of you not watching, which is everybody, it's fun. It's like a, a Spike Lee movie, watching him run with his phone. <laughs> It's funny because you say that we're talking about Malcolm X. Um, <laughs> so my the battery on the device I'm using is dying. So I had to run from the garage to another room where there's a piano being tuned to trying to avoid my children who desperately want to talk to me. So I had to stiff arm them. It's a football game. <laughs> daddy, daddy, help. No. Away, no. child. Get away. Get away from me. Like an old school where he's Will Ferrell's just pushing people out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets tranked. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, would I recommend this movie? Um, I would recommend it. I don't think that the CGI is so bad that those things that we talked about wouldn't come through. I would 100% recommend this movie. I would just, it was distracting. I didn't yeah. notice. I'm not as in tune to bad visual effects. I guess I overlook them most of the time too, but I would definitely recommend especially to marvel fans even like uh martial arts fans it was just really well done when it's not cgi but yeah, uh, would, and i would say it's better than black widow as far as the movie marvel movies we've gotten this year yeah how does see uh, do he did well um i think one of the things that they did with this movie really well is there's a good balance of action and comedy and heart like this movie moves slower in some respect than a lot of marvel movies and not in a bad way i, I mean, would say it felt there were at least long. there were at least three scenes of people just sitting down talking and eating actually five there are five so that's how it starts there's a scene yeah i'm not gonna say them all but there are at least don't five scenes. Them all. <laughs> yeah it's like there after the big murder scene <laughs> of people just sitting down and talking and having real conversations about stuff um i really look all over again (laughs) yeah they took their time with this i didn't think that it was necessarily long nick um but i i did it felt like that they were trying to get you to live in this world and they told a really cool story that i think jammer you might appreciate um it was there was an immigrant aspect to the story of wanting to move to another country to have your family do better and then want your kids to do better and see what that's like. Um, And so you have the expectations of these parents who move from another country and putting that pressure on your kids to have them do better. And I I really liked that aspect of the story. I will say Mm -hmm. the part that just felt long was the finale. Like it was like last call or even getting our checks and stuff. And I'm like, I don't, I won't without saying anything about it. It's like, I don't particularly care for some of the events in this finale. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I will also say, as a super positive, remember how I said I didn't like Aquafina when we were watching Raya yeah. and the Last Dragon? It's because all of her comedies in her face. Since then, I've watched uh, Nora from Queens, and I love it. And I loved her in this. She's like the perfect, like, uh, what's the term for the funny one? <laughs> Comic so perfect. relief. Perfect comic relief. She's so good. Now, what's, what's that person? I know what you're talking about. The person who's not the straight man, right? 
Is that what you were talking about? Well, comic relief is what I meant. Uh, was it comic like relief this, we meant? Okay. Yeah. Well, foil would be if she's not the straight man. I liked her also in uh, Crazy Rich Asians. She was great. I need in that. to watch that. She was good in that. I just know her from Queens is one of my favorite shows after watching it. I'm like, God, she's fine. I only watched the first few episodes, but I thought it was good. But not really a show that I am interested in. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a jam show at all. (laughs) Nah. Yeah. A little bit aimless. I don't know. I would even say cynical. Something you don't like. Eh. I mean, but the the characters. uh, Characters are not at all. It's just she lives in a cynical world. Anyway. (laughs) Um, The other thing that I liked about this is you got a couple of different fight style so you got to see very i I hate using the shorthand but it's the one i'll use so you got to see crouching tiger hidden dragon Mm -hmm. style like fighting that's almost like dancing mixed with very kinetic um just straight kung fu film and so that was a very cool mix of things because you don't often it is infrequent to see both of those things in american cinema because his, um, his style is very much, as I've been saying since the trailer, Jackie Chan. Like, you know, using other items. Like, you know, in that one clip they released, wrapping people up in your sweater. Yeah. Like, things I think of when I think of Jackie Chan. Just because I'm, I'm way more, obviously I've seen way more Jackie Chan than I have probably any other. I don't know artist. if that's necessarily obviously, but. Well, I mean, for me, the type of movies I watch, I'm like seeing, I'm not even just seeing him in Japanese, I mean, Chinese movies. I'm seeing him in like Rush <laughs> Hour and Rush Hour 2 and like Shanghai Nights. You know, Shanghai Nights, the movie is not great, but the action scenes are really good. Yeah. I'll say yeah, that about most American Jackie really Chan good. movies. How dare you? Rush Hour is a oh. fucking classic. Oh, I love what about Shanghai Noon? Shanghai Noon's also a fucking. Oh, classic. I said the sequel first. Wait, yeah, aren't there Shanghai three? Aren't first. there three Rush Hours? The three. Yeah, there are. Yeah, but you no, there aren't. The third one. No, there aren't. There's no third one. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> the one with Roman Plansky in it. Remember? <laughs> I hated that um, movie so much. I got so bored during that. It wasn't movie. even feature length. It was like 75 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 fucking Brett Ratner. Oh, gross. Brett Ratner directed those movies. It's not a classic. What am I talking about? Eh, I already own them. Their class. Anyway. I don't have to pay Brett Ratner anymore. That, that's not how that works. Yeah, um, I know. I uh, I don't know that there's anything else I could say about the movie without spoiling it. Um, I can just imagine. Before we spoil, I just it. imagine the economics of it is just like Nick literally paying this guy millions of dollars, and the guy's rich, and then we find out that guy's rapist, and then he's like, "Oh, well, it's a good thing I already own your stuff. I don't have to give you any money." <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. Well, it's not like <laughs> okay. So I had a girlfriend who was like taught me kind of this kind of stuff like behavior but but she actually destroys the stuff from people she likes and i'm like you should at least resell it and make money off the guy because now you're making the money i don't i don't believe in that (laughs) it's a slippery slope if you start pulling that thread i hate to be that person but it's just like everything has a dark history everything is racist everything is sexist everything is everything (laughs) it is it absolutely is it's like Never mind. We, we can it's like, it. like it's like watching like watching freaking Diva Zapata, a great movie, but then you have fucking white guys playing Mexicans, and that's just weird. I saw that so long. Ago. Wait, how old is that movie? It's old, right? It's like from the fifties. I have no recollection of. I saw it in grade school, so I have no recollection of that. Senator. Who people just what race anybody was i was so young mm. that it just did not make an impression like what you're yeah, telling marlon me mexicans, brando mexicans from that brown time don't look like that yeah right it's funny for the longest time i actually thought that eli wallach was actually mexican i was very disappointed <laughs> see exactly you're like you just have no idea so disappointed <laughs> should we give our uh, grades before we let jammer go and before spoilers i'm really conflicted on I don't know what grade to give. I haven't thought. What grade to give it? Like I went back and forth. So I don't I think know. I have one. What's your grade? What's your? I'll say B plus. I'm kind of between a B plus and an A minus. Um, I I love the villain in this movie. I thought that he was so good and so captive. I like I liked everything else about the movie, but. Or the criticisms that people generally have of Marvel movies, the villains being usually one of the highest ones. Um, I really liked him. 
Like I walked away liking him. Yeah. So it's all not saying I would do what he did, but I really did like him. Fair. In in any other movie, he could have been the hero. He could have been the hero of the story. I like that. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. All right, gents. So. Well, with that, I will take my leave so you guys can dive into specifics. But I've appreciated this time and I'll talk you to you later. Shit your brains out. No, I'm good for now. Okay. <laughs> good for now. Yeah. Later. Adios. Adios. Um, that fucker right there. Man, fuck that. <laughs> Thank God he's gone. Every time. <laughs> that's, the, that's the joke, everyone. That is- I had to explain the joke. I don't know if it's a joke. Is it a joke? It's not a joke. It's true. It's a recurring segment of um, he left. I don't know that there are too many spoilers that I would go into other than I have a weird question. Tell me, can you explain this? So part of the plot of this movie is their mom makes this dragon. She makes an um, origami dragon. And then Shang-Chi gets the dragon drawn on a postcard and that's how he knows the address to where his sister is right yeah if their father knew exactly where both of them were what was the point of the postcard to after he i don't know to get to get them in the same location why just in case the bus boy thing happened why? what they called him bus boy i don't know yes. i don't even know where it actually came from I don't know where, what sent, came from. His dad, do you think the dad sent it? That's my best. Theory. She said she didn't send it. Yeah. So yeah, dad sent it. What's the point of getting them in the same spot? I don't know. To so get them to kind of, I don't know. To kind of get them together as Why? children before they take them Why? in. I don't know. I don't know. Why? I didn't even think about that while watching it. <laughs> I was thinking about Wong like kicking Abomination's ass and then it was just training because he's dragging him back through and he's like, next time I'll teach you how to pull your punches. Yeah. <laughs> he's like rehabilitating phase one villains. That's interesting. I'm really curious where that's going to go, especially since we expect to see him in the She-Hulk series. Yeah. I wonder. I wouldn't doubt if you see Wong and more stuff like that too. In the yeah. Series. If he's trying to be the, the rehabilitator. Like, we all know, I mean, obviously Spider-Man's not out yet. We all know where the fuck Wong is taking off to during the most important events in the universe. He's got a lot of bags, War. right? He's got a lot of bags. Yeah, he's got a lot of shit. Like, he's going to travel the world, even though he can just go. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so I guess the um, main spoilers I would want to get into let's hear it. is, like, I didn't know what those creatures were behind that wall. If it was, like, a recognizable Marvel character or something, it would be exciting. But I was, that That's the part I didn't like. I like the dad as a villain. I didn't like this random magical creature showing up. Yeah. As like the main force that they had to fight. And I yeah, there was I way too agree. much of that and the dragon fighting it and it fighting back and Aquafina getting an arrow just the right spot. And letting the other dude die. The dad? No, the um the guy, oh, the guy is... next to her. She couldn't see yes. him. He was well, he's like aim for the throat. She's literally holding a bow and arrow. And then he shoot, dies right shoot next Shoot the to creature. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Creaching the shoot, shoot the creature. I will say, oh, here's something we can talk about now that we're under spoilers. Trevor Slatterly. So that was God. That was great. I can't believe how well that worked. I thought he was going to get like a three minute cameo, but no, he's talking, he's telepathic with this weird little creature without a face. Like when he's giving them directions, he's like, three, two, quick right here. <laughs> That was awesome. And when he's playing dead, he's like, shh, I'm acting. <laughs> no, the best part, part. Get down here with me. The best part was the Planet of the Apes part. Yeah. And he's like, I wanted to be an actor. My mom told me that the, no, he's like, I loved it. I'm like, how they get the apes to do that? And she's like, they were actors. And I was like, these apes can be actors. So they were not riding the horse. They were acting as if they were riding they were the horse. <laughs> He's just so fun. Like, why they kept him alive? Because they put the one shot up on Disney Plus. Mm-hmm. That's important. And he was seen at the premiere. So I'm like, okay, three minute cameo. And he's like yeah. one of the he's like the main white character in the movies. Yeah. I I was surprised, <laughs> just me. like you. Um, given what we knew about him at the premiere, the one shot going up. Yeah, I just like you. I did not expect it to be as long of a part as big of a part 
I think he's but he was like he was in there in this than Iron Man three. I think. Yes, one hundred percent. Definitely like more there lines. When, like the training montage, like in any kind of Seven Samurai type movie, and he's like, just hanging around. He's got like their cloak and their colors on, and he's just like, yeah, he's fighting. I was, um, hoping, I knew I really he wasn't that. dead, but I'm like, oh, it would crush me if he's dead. But he's like, I'm hacked. I'm like dead. What was it? Was it Morris? What was the name of the yeah the I think it was chicken Morris. pig? What they called it a chicken pig? I think they called it, they called it a chicken pig at one point. Okay. Um. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I um, I'm curious. So let's talk about the end credit scene. So we get mm. two end credit scenes. Um, what was the first one? I don't know why I'm blanking. The first on what one the first was the one good was. one. I didn't care for the second one. The first the f- one was literally there are holograms of Captain Marvel right. and Bruce Banner, not not Professor Hulk, but with the broken arm, talking yeah, she about looked, how like, terrible. What? He looked terrible. Is that what they said to him? No, no. I'm saying Mark Ruffalo looked awful. Oh, like he? I can't tell if that was like he just looked. He looked like he had aged significantly between now and the last time we saw him. Huh, I'm not I didn't curious. That was that on purpose? And of course, I mean, I I don't think they've. She changes appearances anytime, every time. I don't even think this was. I think this is one of the appearances she had between the other looks. It felt like like they didn't yeah. really, but. Just the idea of disgust. And then Wong, of course, being like, come with me. It's like, yeah. he's, he's kind of his character characteristic now is like, hey, come on. And then, yeah, just yeah. The, kind of the mystery of, in the comics, they mention in the opening that maybe he found it in a comet or something. And in the mm-hmm. comics, it is related to the dragon who's an alien who does come yeah. to Earth. But I like that they're kind of making it a not infinity stone i'm glad they're finally trying to move on to that but they're still like this shit's old we don't know the origin of this shit and we like know all right. kinds of stuff yeah i so I, that's an interesting I mystery. did not like i did not like like you i did not like having either of um bruce banner or um captain marvel there oh but... i did like having them there I did. That, that was the that was the most important. I, that's where you're like, ah, I actually said, "Holy fuck!" When uh, Brie Larson showed up, I didn't say that when Ruffalo did, but when she did, I said it a little too loud. I'm like, oh fuck! Like I like two Avengers. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. It'll it'll be interesting to see what happens. But yeah, I do think that about that scene, the most interesting thing to me about it was exactly what you said: the fact that Professor Hulk wasn't there. Yeah, so I'm but curious what that means. Up. Yeah, I think we'll see him past even uh, She Hulk. I feel like Ruffalo, someone like uh, Thor, uh, Chris Hemsworth, who's like, I'll keep playing the but half the time he's CGI. Of course, I'll keep playing the Hulk for future yeah. Avengers movies. You keep on paying me, I'll keep showing up, baby. It's my best paycheck of my life, even though I love my <laughs> little independent personal movies. Um, and then the second post credit sequence, my favorite part was after that right after the post credit sequence where it doesn't say Shang-Chi will return. It says the 10 rings will return. Yeah. And you're like, so that's and the I, one you said you didn't like. I didn't like it as much. It was just kind of, I waited till the end. I had to go to the bathroom a little bit. It's just the sisters in charge and they've kind of remodeled the place with girl power. And it's like, cool. <laughs> like, yeah, I like she'll it be back. because I like it because it played on the one thing that I thought was kind of interesting. Like the idea that she'd been ignored by her father, her entire yeah. life. And you know, she talked about um, if he won't let me into this empire, then I will build my own. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting to me that she seemed to be good at the end of the movie, but then maybe not. Right. Like it's hard to let go of that trauma. She was abandoned by her brother, ignored by her father. And so it very much seems that she is more interested in um, building an empire. Now, whether that's going to be an empire for good or bad, we'll see. But I, I liked that because it it spoke to it spoke to a um, an authenticity to her character. Yeah, I, I would have almost switch, uh, switched the scenes just because I think the the more exciting one is the, like we don't know what the fuck this technology like this is like ancient like shit but we don't know how old like so he's been wearing it for how many thousands of years it's much older than that like it's just you know yeah. I don't know MacGuffins are fun in the MCU. 
obviously we've spent an entire saga on six the same six MacGuffins, but yeah, I'm glad I'm glad we're going to get to see something else. I'm curious what it's gonna look like. Because people keep claiming they like see infinite like I mean obviously they were in Loki, but they're like, oh, each color of the episode represents a different stone. It's like no 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 no. We're trying to get past them at this point. We still yeah. have to talk about the decimation. Like in this movie was she kind of like this movie addressed the least and just like Spider-Man, the world looked completely fine compared yeah. to what we've been seeing on Disney Plus. But and I I was I was really hoping, even though it would just be for people like that, they would show it when he's talking about the other Mandarin, they would have just seen it. Or even him, they would have seen a shot of Tony Stark, just even a photograph of Tony Stark. Because nah, then they reference the third one, but then because most people forget Ten Rings was in the first the before the credit sequence in the first fucking Marvel movie. We yeah, saw the Ten I, Rings. I don't that doesn't bother me that much. Like I feel like that is a thing for like if you're it's a deep cut, quote unquote deep cut for people that have been following these movies this entire time. Yeah. And if you caught it because you've been following it, good for you. Like if you didn't, fuck off. Like these movies have been around for such a long time. Like yeah. it doesn't impact the story. No, it does. I just was hoping that for much. some people in the crowd to gasp if they like showed that picture or something because they forgot. Who cares? Because you can trace it all the way back to the very first Marvel. I do. The other thing, it doesn't bother me. It's just this happens all the time in the Marvel universe. I feel more than the two examples I'm going to use, but they're just like Hydra where they're like, we changed the course of history and like they even shows them like bombing a building like in modern days yeah. assassinating people and you're like that's hydra that's like how many organizations in marvel is that yeah but it doesn't bother me it's just like oh you and hydra may have like fought each other at some point trying to fix the control world the order. world that yeah, would actually blown be up cool. each other's buildings so that i would want to see i want to see if hydra and the ten rings ever like cross paths right because they're like you said they're both these organizations that have been trying to control the world from behind the scenes so what happens when these two organizations bump up against each other bump up against each other yeah bump up against each other <laughs> all in your face um so yeah i uh that's pretty much all i have to say yeah. about the movie it's solid i really like the production design and stuff and like you said balancing more urban uh just because they're set in the city uh, martial arts versus yeah the very he, the, uh, he learns from his aunt aunt and then his mother knew was the very crouching tiger like leaves yeah it was really cool to see and yeah, yeah. it was beautiful the mom and the mom meets the dad it, it, very quickly you're like this isn't a fight scene this is a dance like, <laughs> this is awesome and yeah he's very relatable for that when he had a family he was happy he took off the rings He's like, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm even like willing to grow old with this woman because the rings keep me alive forever. And then it's only after the murder of his wife that he goes back to like, yeah, like we see the scene right after where he takes his young son to, I think it's the darkest scene in the movie to the, to get revenge. And then you yeah. don't even see half of it because it's kind of in a broken mirror because it is really violent. But he just destroys them all with many different wings like ring yeah. type attacks which yeah i really feels like, like it unredeems him but then again at the end he just he's being tricked by another entity like dormammu and dr strange to be like oh i'm your wife help by behind the wall yeah i'm curious how long that influence had been happening and what impact that was having on him um like when he put the rings on did it start happening immediately after his son left like how where did that I think I Come felt from. it started happening right before he grabbed his kids, which is why he grabbed them. Hmm. Like he says, you've been out there long enough. I let it happen as an experiment. I think he brought them back as soon as he, he tells them the mom's story pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. Like just bring the family together. Bring my kids in to help rescue their rescue mother. Mom. Yeah, that was good. And I like that scene, that fight scene between the two of them yes. as they're having that conversation about, I, that fight scene, like the things that he was starting to say to Shang Chi, like that stuff hurt because he was the fact that he was blaming him for the death of his mother, even though he was seven, yeah. um, was just just completely incredible. I love that back and forth between the two of them. Um, it it cut deep. It's really good. And then it's like you know, it's a Marvel movie, so you're like, who's behind the mask of that one guy? 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> He's the first guy doesn't to get matter. his soul sucked out. Yeah. I kind of like that. I there was a part of me I was like, oh, is this guy gonna be somebody? Is he somebody yeah. important? Is this somebody from his past? Like, who fucking cares? It was very Probably Ryan Johnson like he's dead. It's a mask they share with each other. It's an old guy because yeah. he was training him like when he was a kid, ago. like yeah. So huh, who knows? Who cares? Good movie. It was good. Um, I'm I swear I'm struggling. I feel like the CGI thing and that last little bit has me struggling between a B plus and an A minus. I'll also so, say B plus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not okay. really even. I'm not really a guy who criticizes CGI because I know there's like bad CGI in like every movie. This movie. Yeah, this was it just felt really rough to me. Um, it felt undercooked. So, um, but yeah. Anything else to say about this? All good. All right. So what I'm going to do is bringing it back to Marvel and Wong. There was a movie that I got to see a couple of weeks ago, Nine Days, uh, starring Winston Duke and Benedict Wong. Oh, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and Zazie Beats. It's really good. And I got a chance to sit down at a press round table with Winston Duke as he talked about this movie. He hated my question, uh, oh, but no. he liked some other questions. It's fine. He didn't say he hated it, but. You didn't get a, a, a reaction like you did for Michael B. Jordan that one not so not even like that he reacted to everyone else's questions so basically i wasn't gonna say this but the story was so everyone asked their questions at the end he was like oh great questions from and he named everyone on the call except me <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't say no not you he was just like thanks everybody yeah he's like thanks and he was like and this person and you and you and you and you really good questions but he's like saying names um and oh, i think man. i was the only person whose name he didn't say so you know it stung a little bit you know, i can feel it i can feel it burn <laughs> my eyes a little bit um but i'm gonna drop some of the audio from that interview in this just so you guys can hear that uh but it was a good time it was still fun listening to him talk about the process of creating the characters for that movie and i highly recommend it like if you haven't seen it nine days um nine days it's nine slow days. Um, it's cerebral. Uh, Benedict Wong, when he was talking about the movie, he called it uh, spy fi, so spiritual fiction. Oh, um, I thought you meant yeah. like spy fi, like uh, spies. But... No, no, SPI, spy fi. It, because the director was trying to figure out how to classify this movie when he was talking to people about it. And Benedict Wong was actually the one who came up with how to, how to give it a description. So Interesting. it's really good. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah, pretty good. So that said, um, dear listener, you know, we've got other great stuff on the website. We've got some some articles for you to read, some other podcasts. Go check those out. I'm sure you'll enjoy them. But other than that, Nick, where can you be found? I'm at Geeky Nick Doll on Twitter. I do this and Marvel Multiverse Mayhem, which comes out on Thursday, another podcast. And I just want to shout out to one of our biggest fans. Um, my best, one of my best friends, Chris. Um, he's at, you're actually his favorite. I talked with him this week. Yes. Um, he's having Number a really one. rough week, so if anyone can just send him good vibes, that would be fantastic. And Chris, hope you're having a, a good week. I hope it gets better. Have a great weekend. Um, yeah, feel better, man. And you can find me at Sir Jonesius on Twitter as well as Instagram, and of course right here on Breaking Deep for the podcast. Folks, as always, thanks for listening and we will catch you on the next one. Hasta lasagna. Don't get any on ya. for the amazing opportunity of life. If you are selected, you will have the chance to be born in a fruitful environment where you can grow, develop, and accomplish. Am I dead? I wouldn't say you're alive or dead.
Are you the boss? I would say a cog in the wheel. <laughs> How long is this process? If you make it until the end. Nine days. With Will, and that's a great question. Um, what did I do to create the character? Um, with Will, it was it was a lot of different things I did. So I one method of training that I used was Alexander Technique, which is all about posture, spinal alignment, and breath work for essentially doing everything with as little effort as possible to create ease because this is a character that was essentially doing everything that he could be to have a new state of existence. He did not want to feel like a human being. He did not want to emote. He was doing everything he could to keep it under control and be all about the action, all about what he has to do for his job and really focus on being diligent in the work. So for everything, I was just like, how can I be as fluid as possible? How can I just not exert as much energy as possible to be as effective as possible in any given circumstance? And he is very performative, which is, you know, that's, that's the whole thing about Will is he's trying to perform and be essentially what he believes every character needs without stressing himself. He is a walking stress test for everyone else. He's putting them in situations that is gonna really yield results to see if they're gonna be the ones that he chooses or not. And yeah, Alexander Technique is one of the things I did. I worked on uh, smiling depression. I feel like it's a functional depressive state that will exist in where he can be productive he can be present he can do all be in all these places in proximity to others but be really torn up dying inside but just still just be present which is something a lot of us deal with we walk around with so i worked on and researched a lot of um, smiling depression and then i worked on his persona being his shadow so in my experience, all of us have our light and our shadow. And our shadow are the aspects of ourselves that we tend to run away from, that we don't accept in ourselves. And they tend to come out under deep stress. Um, whether it's a long-term relationship that lasts <laughs> no more than five years, and a person actually finds and sees your shadow after you know a lot of circumstantial stress. Um, or it comes out under pressure of work, life things, different things, but your shadow tends to come out when you can't really control it. So I was working on this character existing inside his own shadow and not being very connected to his own personal light until it's ripped from him and it emerges at the end, which is why people respond so much to that big monologue at the end of the movie that big performance at the end of the movie is one that exists in all of Will's own personal light. And everyone goes, wow, it's so magnetic because it's all of the things that were trapped inside of that character until the very end, until it's like sucked out of him. Um, and really just focusing on a lot of the relationships with the, the different characters. But that was a big part of my process, which is like blending in this like crucible of my, you know, of my own person, um, all these different ways of being, all these different um, methods of, of, of figuring out who this guy is and like saying he died at a certain time where he's very in tune with classical um, performance so he's redesigned himself as this like classical performer even though that's not what he was in real life so I worked on him kind of feeling a little bit if he spoke he could have like a Paul Robeson kind of feel to him and I worked on a mid-Atlantic dialect 
that wasn't, you know, it, it's very clear, it, it delivers information, but it's hard to just place. And my Trinidadian kind of sing song, it, it always creeps out. So we did a lot of work to make sure that didn't come through and that it felt like a very distinct character. One of the best compliments I've been given was a very close friend of mine was like, I didn't know who you were in that movie. I never seen this person. I haven't, I don't know. That wasn't you. And there are times where I see more of you in your characters and I, I don't know who I saw in that movie. And I said, yeah, good, thank you. You know what I mean? And that, that's, that was, that's what we strive for. My name is Brandon from LRM Online. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So this is a beautiful movie. Um, and as you said, it, it leaves you with more questions than answers. And the question that I wanted to ask you was, was there anything about this movie that challenged either your uh, spiritual beliefs or beliefs about this world? Is there anything that you walked away struggling with or challenged with uh, based on this film? No, it wasn't challenged. I think my spiritual beliefs are pretty, pretty concrete. I grew up Christian. But I'm the type of Christian that's just very open to everyone else's walks of faith and their own spiritual traditions and practices. I believe religion, spirituality, all that stuff is really leading in the same direction. It's the same thing as languages. You know, you might all be speaking different languages, but human intention tends to be very universal. Emotions, love is universal. Pain is universal anger betrayal all those things are universal so in that same way we're all kind of expressing and feeling a lot of the same stuff we're just using different languages so i'm super accepting of different um spiritual beliefs overall um and i can't say that it was challenged if anything it was more galvanized and concretized um we had like things happen that was just like spiritual synchronicity on set where you know, set designer is making my notes as Will made these notes about the characters that Will take. Like he wrote these things, but it was really the set designer that wrote those notes for me, maybe two months prior. And Zazie Beats and David Rizdal. David Rizdal plays the artist who like is really good at drawing but hates his work. They're a real couple in real life. So that's Zazie Beats' is, um, fiance. And her and I are in the scene in the office and she looks down at my notes and she's like, I've always wondered what the, the characters are writing about each other. Like what, 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 is, what your character is writing about us? Like, can I see? And I said, yeah, take a look. And then she looks at um, what I wrote about David's character. And on the paper, it said something about like a very Machiavellian approach. He has this, this, da, 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 da. And she goes, did David help you write this? Did David help you write this at all? And I said, no, this was set design. They probably did this a couple months ago. She goes, that's weird. He really didn't have anything to do with this? I said, no. And she goes, well, he's reading Machiavelli the Prince right now. That's really weird, right? And then in the, the cupboard behind me in set design, there was a book of poetry. That was a book of poetry about World War One veterans wrote all these poems and it was dedicated to this like colonel or something that survived three days um, alone fighting the enemy. And it was written that he didn't allow any enemy to pass other than into oblivion. And I looked this guy up. He looks like Will, he's just a white man, but he's like tall like Will. They called him the Count because he was very quiet and silent and like a bit looming. He had the same glasses as my character, Will. And he was so shell-shocked after World War I that he went sailing and just never came back one day and committed suicide. Uh, well, suicided, I think is the term that people use. And suicided. And yeah, I said, this is uncanny because this is the character. That is Will. And it's a guy who felt a lot, like he was written that he was a very like soft, wonderful guy put into an extraordinary circumstance and survived. 
and what they wrote about him poetically was the action of what I'm doing as well. And I said, Edson, isn't this crazy? And Edson is an atheist. So in his opinion, he did not write a spiritual movie. The movie is inspired by the story by his his uncle. His uncle committed suicide at, at 50 years old. And the family wouldn't talk about this uncle. They would just say, don't be like your uncle. He was weak. Your uncle was weak. So as he got older and went through his own depression and his own like mental health stuff, he researched his uncle, found out this guy was a really beautiful guy that just never got to live the life of an artist that he wanted, that he was a translator. Edson is Japanese, but a Japanese immigrant to Brazil. And essentially, this was an opportunity to rewrite the narrative of his uncle's life in an afterlife situation, give him another chance. And yeah, <laughs> that's this movie. And this movie in itself has a lot of spiritualism, but it was not the intention, according to Edson. But it's just there. But I think that's what makes it really great art is because he made it for a very specific intention, but really great art attaches itself fibrously to our own experiences and we can find depth and add depth to like something that already has a lot of depth when it comes and connects with your own experience. I think that's what's really beautiful about it, that it becomes a spiritual movie. It becomes a, a, a treatise on like a spiritual journey and, and exploration because it has such specific intention and it connects to that deeper part of you that only has questions. You don't know if God exists. You don't know, but you believe, you have faith. It's more questions than answers. It's more questions than answers. And I think those are the aspects of us where this movie really resonates. It resonates to the deep parts of us where we have more questions than answers, you know?